John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Thank you, Tim. Well, exciting things are coming up. The Harvest Festival is going to be in a couple of weeks, and so that's going to be a great time to be able to uh, reach out to the neighborhood and just be able to talk to some people about who we are and let them know that we're friendly people, that we're not that scary. Uh, well, some of you are, never mind. <laughs> so you can wear a, wa a mask to cover it up and everything else, and... Uh, that's just what happens with us. There's a lot of great things that we're able to do on that. And so we need some extra help. We're going to need some people to sign up and to help us with that and to be able to uh, take care of that many people. So we're planning on quite a crowd. And, uh, of course, we're planning on you being there. Uh, being able to help with all of that is going to be a great thing and a great outreach to this neighborhood. So... I want to talk to you about principles this morning, about the way in which we live. We decide we're going to live a certain way. We decide we're going to be honest. We decide we're going to be fair. We decide, and those are just basic things that we make. But what's the biggest principle? And when we look at Scripture, there's a lot of them. I tried to look up a few and decide, well, here's the basic principle. How many principles do you need anyway? And so I saw this one. I thought, this is great. Five manly principles to live an amazing life. Well, that, that's only part one, though. That kind of worried me. I thought, well, maybe there's more to it. You know, I, I, I just wanted that one to be able to, to look like Superman. And then I saw this one. It has 15 principles to live by. Well, that's got to be a better life than the five, right? So... I mean, if you only have five, it's not as much. Fifteen is better. And then I saw this one, 101. That just seems ridiculous. I'm not sure I could even remember that many principles or what it's like. And this is going to make my life better. Somehow this is going to make things the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but we pick. We have principles that we live by. And we see attitudes and we see behaviors. And so... What is it that the Bible shows us about those things? What does the Bible say we should be doing? Not just a list of commands, right? When you go through and read the Bible, it's not just a list of do this and don't do that. Now, there are some parts like that, but that certainly isn't the whole thing. When we see Jesus growing up in Jesus' time, they did have laws. They did have laws once Moses starts, and he says, let's put in a law system and I believe there were, I've seen numbers like 623 laws. So that's, that's a lot. How can you remember all those? I mean, but they're the, you know, do this, don't do that type of thing. It's not a principle. It's just a law and says we do that. When Jesus starts teaching, though, he seems to teach more about principle. It's not just a matter of don't hit, don't bite, don't scratch, don't, you know, he says, be nice to your neighbor. Well, that kind of covers the hitting and biting and scratching, right? And, and so it's a more of a principle than it is a list of laws or a list of commands. Um, and so that's what we see Jesus doing, and we pick those. And I think what happens is we start out with very general ones, and then we may add another one and add another one, and add another one. 
And so when people first approach the Bible, they begin to look at, well, what does it mean? What does it look like? Uh, what am I supposed to do and how am I supposed to do these things? Usually they will pick that scripture that we have just read. Not the whole thing, just the first part, right? Because that talks about how God didn't, he sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And we shouldn't be condemned, but, you know, some people are because they don't really know Jesus. And now we don't want all of that. That's way too much. So let's boil it down to something you can put on a poster. That's all we need. So let's just take verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. They may. They should, depending on the version you have. But that's what it talks about, that God loves me, that God acted first, that God gave his only begotten son, that that's the way in which we're able to see life. It's not given as a promise that every single person will have eternal life. It says they may have eternal life, they should have eternal life if they respond to God. It's not a promise that gives them that they will, but it's a principle that God has done this and God has left room and God has allowed this to be a part of our life. He has allowed this to happen. It is a truth. It's something we're able to see and understand. And I think we've developed a whole theology around just this one verse so that that becomes everything and salvation is really not limited to one scripture uh, certainly faith is essential but you can see a lot of things like this if you just look at the world around you so if you're watching football this is the greatest evangelistic shot ever right not just because Minnesota is up that was just for Joanne. <laughs> That's her team. She always wears purple. But it's the detail. Do you see the detail? Do you see the gospel? I'll give you a little bit clearer. The way to do evangelism is hold up a sign that says John 3.16. Because we've come to the point where that's it. That's the whole thing. It's only one verse. I don't know why they wrote all the rest of that stuff, but the only principle that we take from the Bible is God loved the world. God sent his son. Everybody's supposed to believe in him. Ah, very simple. So we don't write it out. All we do is hold up John 3.16. And people see that, then they will know, okay, therefore I'm saved. Or you could do this. There you go. That's all you have to do. Read my t-shirt. We're done. And it's a real simplistic look, but I think for the world, that's as far as it gets. That's the only Bible principle that they know, is God loved the world. God sent his son. That's where it is. And whatever you can do to attract attention to that, that's the most important thing. But I think we have to move on a little bit further in our relationship looking at what God says. And so, maybe Matthew seven twelve. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And so this is called the golden rule. We know that because it's even labeled in your Bible, the golden rule. Now Jesus didn't say this is the golden rule. But for some reason, we have given that. Here is the prom, or not the promise, but, but here is the principle. This is the golden rule. Follow this rule. And it really doesn't describe everything, certainly. It's not about salvation. It doesn't mention God, but it goes nice on a poster. And so, therefore, that's what we do. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is a little bit harder, isn't it? Because it's not just about God acting. This means you're going to act first, and you're going to do something first. And so you're going to treat them the same way you want to be treated. In other words, you're asking people to treat you the way that you act. Please treat me like this. 
And so that's what we're saying with this principle. Uh, but it is harder. It means me doing it first. It isn't complete. It isn't the only thing. But certainly it does solve some issues between people when they tend to argue, when they get selfish, when they fight. You know, if you just treat the other person like you want to be treated, chances are you're going to resolve that. And so it's going to be good. And so that's one of the principles that we might adopt. The one that I hear a lot, and maybe the one that I hear the most, is from Matthew chapter 22. And it's called the Great Commandment. The Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. And it says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So this is a trap. They're trying to set him up. They're trying to say, well, what's the greatest command? And then that gives you a chance to argue. Pick out of the 623 that we have, what's the one greatest command? And oddly enough, Jesus does not go to one of the big Ten Commandments that Moses got from the top of the mountain. He doesn't mention the ones that are written in stone that God gave to them. But he mentions this out of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. It is given there. It's not even mentioned in Exodus. And when you look at it, it says, Love God with your heart, your soul, and your might. That's the original quote out of Deuteronomy. But Jesus says heart, soul, and mind. And so he puts a little bit of a difference on it. When you look at Mark, I know you already saw this slide. When you look at Mark, he has another one with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. So this is in Mark 12 and verse 30, another time when Jesus is saying this is the important command. And so strength, might, that would be the same thing. But still, Jesus puts in this idea of mind as well. And so Jesus gives this as the greatest command. He says, this is what I would look to. Now, you realize when they're asking this, they're asking this as a trap. They're asking this to be able to confront him, to prove he's not right. But he gives them another chance. He says, well, there's another one that I would put second. And the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. And that's quoted out of Leviticus 19.18. And so Jesus is giving them the law that he thinks is the greatest. And so he gives them both of those. So he says, on this depend the law and the prophets. He didn't say on this depend all future Christianity. He didn't say on this is everything that you're going to need to know in the 21st century. He said, this is Old Testament stuff. But for some reason today, we've taken this principle and said, all right, here is the whole gospel. Here is the whole thing. Everything is love God and love your neighbor. If you do those two things, then you have done something really great. And that's true. But is that enough? Is that the biggest principle you've got? Is that the principle Jesus lived by? Well, certainly Jesus loved God. And certainly he showed his love to God, even though he does not seem to go around saying, oh, I just love God so much. You don't see that. But he does love God. Does he love his neighbor? Absolutely. He's about to die on a cross for his neighbor. And so certainly that would be part of this. And so, loving God, loving your neighbor, it does depend, or it does make a difference in all the other commandments. And that would make it most important, because if you don't have love for people, and yet you do pay your bills, but you just don't like them, you 
don't have love for people, but no, it, it makes a difference in everything, doesn't it? In the way you talk, in the way you act, and so loving God and loving your neighbor are very, very important. But they are Old Testament. And that's what Jesus describes them as, as being the foundation of Old Testament. It's not his new one. It's not what Jesus takes as his greatest command. And so if you look at Scripture closely, Jesus commanded to love many times. Uh, love one another is one of the main things. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so certainly there were commands of love that were given all the time, but I don't think that's the biggest principle that Jesus lived by. I think he sets the bar a little bit higher than that. When he talks to God, it's not about how much I love God. I think God's so great, I just love him so much. You don't see that from Jesus. But you do see something else. In John chapter 14, there's just this short section that I think is maybe a demonstration of what this is like. John is writing about Jesus as he's in the upper room. And Jesus tells his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He says, the works that I do are so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's what I think he's trying to get across. Everything I do is so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Every sermon that I would give, every preaching that I would do, every teaching, every living is so that the Father would be glorified in the Son. That sums up the life of Jesus. That is everything he's trying to accomplish. Loving God is important, but I think this is where he really is. We don't always ask why we do a lot of things, like why do you get up in the morning? Why do you go to work? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why do you go to a cross? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And that's really what I think is the all-consuming principle that Jesus lives by. And so that may be one that we need to follow as well. Ask me anything, I'll do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's the reason why. That's what comes over everything else. And that seems one of the biggest and most important principles that Jesus gives to us and that he lives by. Let me give you a few more scriptures because I know this is a little bit different. We hear the love God, love your neighbor all the time. I think we need to shoot for being better Christians than that. I think we need a better example than that. And the example Jesus gives us is not just loving God and loving our neighbor. It is glorifying God. And that seems to set a higher bar and a higher standard for us. Again, in the upper room in John 13, 31, he says, When he had gone out, when Judas had gone out to betray him, here's Jesus' statement about where he sits at that time. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. He sees even his death as a concept of glory. Now is the Son of Man glorified, because that's why I'm here, is that God might be glorified in everything that I do. Now, at this time, right where I am, is to glorify God. Isn't that why you're here now, right now, at this time? is to glorify God. And so I think that's a statement we can make a lot of times. Jesus' main focus is in how he glorifies God. John 15, 8 is the same thing. It's, it's also in the upper room. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And so when he talks about this one, he talks about what's going to happen with them, that they bear fruit, and bearing fruit glorifies God. And so that's really what he's trying to subscribe. Isn't that just enough if we love him? Well, it's good. But I think Jesus has introduced something else. This is a next level that you would glorify him. If you look back at Matthew 5:16, it talks about letting your light shine. Let your light shine so that others can see your good works and 
glorify your Father in heaven. It's the reason, it's the purpose, it's the overriding principle of why you would do those good works. It's why we are going to be able to have Harvest Festival is, festival is so that people will see our good works and glorify God in heaven. It's the purpose of all of that is so that they're able to see this is what people of God do when they are able to do things for people. John 17 is another one where Jesus is saying his priestly prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You see, as he's looking at the sum of his life and that everything that he's doing, he says, it's all about glorifying you, God. And my prayer is about glorifying you, and my purpose is about glorifying you. And now that I'm looking at the end, I want my death to be something that glorifies you, that you would be able to glorify me. And so I think this is really what Jesus is trying to get across to us. He says, this is the main principle that I live by. Certainly, yes, God sent me. Certainly, God loves the world. Certainly, do good to your neighbor and treat him as you want him to treat you. Certainly, it's good to love God and to love your neighbor. But really, the purpose of my life and everything that I do is to glorify God and that he might be glorified in my life. And so when you start looking at that and start looking at Scripture and the way that it plays out, I think you see this all the way through. You look at Romans 3.23 and it says, We have all sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. And so now my life is to have the glory of God. And so it comes right back to that. Glorifying God is the basis for worship. It's the reason that we're here. The worship seems very important to Jesus. He doesn't miss synagogue. He's going to go because that's what gives glory to God. You look at 1 Corinthians 6. They, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. All the way through, you're going to find instances like this that are showing this is who we are, this is what we do. So we keep all of those principles. We understand the principle that God loves us. We understand that he sent his son. We understand that we can do for others and treat them as we want to be treated. And that we can love God and love our neighbor. But the one that solves some of the conflict that we have from being able to do those other things is glorify God. I think that's really the place it comes to. And so he speaks about doing all to the glory of God in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It's not a competition for who you love best. Love God, love your neighbor. Love your family, love your job, love golf, love to hike, love to kayak, love to... And we get kind of confused sometimes because sometimes loving God and loving your family are two different things. And they don't seem to come out quite the same. I love both, but my family wants this and God wants this and my job wants something completely different. And so we look at the conflict that sometimes is created by all of those things. Well, I'm going to treat them like, they want, like I would want to be treated. Or... You're just going to do what glorifies God. And I think that may be the one that's most important. And so I'm going to do what makes my family glorify God. I'm going to do whatever on my job would cause people to glorify God. I'm going to do people in recreation, whatever would say this guy glorifies God. And so our whole life is summed up in that one thing, to glorify God. And maybe today, if you feel a little bit lost or confused or like, you know, things aren't quite all together in your life, it's because you need the principle. 
here's what's most important. Here's what's first. Here's what focuses me. Yes, God sent his son to this earth. Yes, it's important that we make a, a covenant with him, that we believe in him, repent of our sins, and are baptized into Christ so that now we're able to have this covenant and we learn how to have relationships and get along with people. So we're going to treat them as we would want to be treated. And we're going to love God and we're going to love other people and we're going to give our life so that God is glorified. And you realize what happens back. God glorifies us. And his glory is seen in our life as well. And so maybe today you're living a life of frustration. Things don't work right. Maybe today it seems like you don't have time for anything. Maybe it's time you straighten it out with what God says. Here's what's most important. Here's the thing that he wants you to do. Do what's going to give him glory. If we can help you with that, if we're able to encourage you in that, of what it means to give glory to God, come and let us pray with you. Shall we stand and sing?